I'm Matej Prapratnik. I'm a member of a Scientific Steering Committee of Brace. And I'm also a member of a committee that uh, actually uh, uh, chooses the winners of the Ada Lovelace Award. And it's my great privilege, privilege to chair this session where actually this year winner Maria Vranic will present her talk. So Maria Vranic is a very excellent young res uh, researcher in HPC. So she obtained her uh, master degree in Belgrade, then her PhD in Lisbon, then she went for a postdoc in Prague, and then she got back to Lisbon where she's continuing her research on uh, studying plasma under extreme conditions where quantum effects actually affect the dynamics of plasma uh, using HPC. Uh, she already obtained a lot of awards, so I think that uh, John Dawson Price for best PhD thesis in, uh, in plasma physics, and as well as IBM Scientific Award. And it's my great pleasure to invite you to, this, uh, to the stage where you pre present your winning talk. Thank you very much. So um, my main uh, focus of research is plasma physics and HPC comes um, um, as something that uh, we are doing because we need to uh, since our problems are highly, um, highly nonlinear and the plasmas are very complex systems uh, where that, um, that just require a lot of computation. Okay, so this is already on. Um, I come from Portugal and um, we are quite uh, big users of uh, price facilities, even though we don't have the biggest machine in Portugal. Uh, but we, are, um, we, have, we have been using a lot of um, bi biggest price facilities uh, all over Europe. And uh, uh, my talk today is going to uh, focus on giving you a small feel about uh, how does it look like when you put the plasma on a supercomputer. So, but before starting the talk itself, I would like to thank the committee for uh, giving me this award. And uh, just to tell you, uh, it's a great honor to be associated with the name of Ada Lovelace. And, um, Apart from that, I would like to extend, extend my sincerest thanks to Price, not just for the award, but also for um, keeping this um, opportunity uh, for everyone in Europe that we are able to um, candidate for, uh, for computer time with some nice scientific ideas, and the ideas are evaluated on its merit. And, uh, even if you don't have any resources locally to, to um, be able to uh, run big simulations, if you have a good idea, Price gives you the training if, you're, if uh, you don't know how to use these machines and if your codes are not prepared and they, they, need, they have the need, uh, Price can also help you uh, get the codes to the level um, of sophistication uh, necessary to get to uh, run on those big machines. So, um, I, Price has been really uh, very important for my research from day one, because from the beginning of my PhD I was a user, uh, and uh, I was also participating in the development of our uh, code that uh, runs, uh, that, uh, runs uh, on supercomputers. So um, my, um, <coughs> I would like to also thank my collaborators. Uh, these are the teams uh, in uh, Czech Republic and in Portugal that I worked with most, um, and especially Tomás Grismar, and uh, that is uh, very um, involved in uh, in the quantum uh, quantum. So, so quantum part of the simulations that uh, he, he, was, um, uh, he was responsible for developing uh, the code uh, that's, that's dealing with the quantum processes. And uh, uh, Professor Luis Silva, that was my thesis advisor, and uh, he 
basically is responsible for me somehow entering this field. Um, okay, so we're going to into the physics now. Uh, what is a plasma? A plasma is a set of, um, it, you can think of it as a gas. People call it fourth state of matter. It's a, it's a, it is a state which has 99% uh, of the matter in the universe is in this state. Um, however, just to give you a feel of what it is, you can think of it as a gas, but it's a gas instead of full of neutral particles, it's a full of charged particles that are, so it's overall neutral, but locally you have charges floating about. And um, what happens when you, ha when, when you have something like this is that this is um, already a destroyed material in a sense. So you can think of uh, plasma is a fire, plasma is a cor corona of the sun, plasma is a lightning. Um, and uh, when you have already destroyed material, it's, so the molecular bonds are broken and we cannot uh, easily break it further. So this means that uh, we can apply very, very strong fields in the plasma, and they can be sustained in the plasma w without destroying the, the background. And uh, this, um, this means that we can, if we have those fields locally, we can have extreme conditions that would not be possible to sustain in any other material because every other material would be destroyed. Okay. Um, now, when I say plasmas in extreme conditions, um, there are many physical processes that show up uh, in these plasmas. And uh, one of them is, for example, uh, we get relativistic particles. So this means that particles are uh, moving close to the speed of light, so very, very energetic particles. Then uh, we get a lot of radiation emission. Uh, so we have also some processes called, uh, like the one called radiation reaction, where the particles lose a lot of energy uh, to radiation. Then we can have hard photon emission. So in principle, so when we get close to the s field so strong that we get quantum processes involved in the interaction, we can have an electron emit one photon that carries a very large fraction of its energy, for example, more than 50%. And these kind of photons are, are energetic enough when they're crossing these high fields, they can create an electron-positron pair. So this is a quantum, quantum process here where a photon is in a strong field background and uh, it just decays into an electron and positron. So this can initiate QED cascades. So this is like having those two processes uh, repeated all over, over and over again. So you can even start in principle with one electron. This electron emits a strong photon. This strong photon decays into a new electron position pair. So now we have three particles. Those particles all radiate hard photons. They, are, they keep being re-accelerated by the strong field. So this can go on and on forever in principle. And this is an ex exponential process. And uh, of course, it's not forever really, because once you get enough particles, um, there is going to be um, the a moment where this strong electromagnetic field will be fully absorbed by the plasma you have created. Um, and these kind of plasmas can be uh, found in the, in the nature, in magnetospheres of neutron stars. Um, and I'm sure you've seen this picture because this, this was something that was all over the newspapers a few years ago. It was advertised as an image of a black hole, but it's not an image of a black hole. It's an image of a plasma that's surrounding the black hole. This plasma is in extreme conditions. And this, um, what we're seeing is the radiation that, uh, that uh, reaches the Earth from, uh, from this plasma ring. Now, um, with the next generation of lasers that's gonna be available within about next 10 years or so, um, uh, we will be able to reproduce some of these extreme conditions in the lab by interacting high intensity lasers with electron beams or, or, or solid targets, gas targets in the lab. So, um, why should you care, right? Well, um, there are open questions uh, fundam fundamental open questions that we can answer um, 
by um, doing this physics in the lab. So for example, um, there is something uh, called the uh, um, Bo uh, Born conjecture, uh, and it is, um, it is an assumption about what's the strongest field we can ever achieve. And uh, before, because I mentioned that there are QED cascades, so you can produce new particles, and those particles are going to deplete the field eventually. So what's the, what is the uh, strongest field you can, in principle, achieve? And this is, this is an op that's an open question. Now, um, um, there are also opportunities for applications, um, and uh, one of the applications is acceleration of particles, because I said we can sustain very strong fields in plasmas, so it means we could have com uh, accelerators that are normally kilometers long uh, in a few centimeters of plasma, and there are many schemes how to propo uh, propose. Of course, this is not a very mature technology, so there's still a lot of uh, work to be done. And um, um, one thing that we can expect is that having those very, very intense lasers that uh, when we have introduced the regime where quantum effects are also um, important, things will be different. So there are some schemes, uh, there, there will be new opportunities to make new configurations for acceleration, but also there will be existing schemes that could um, uh, could be very di could act very differently uh, when we have those very very uh, intense lasers. So um, we can we can create particles by using this electron positron pair creation, and uh, we can accelerate them in a plas in a laser plasma interactions. And uh, uh, last but not least, this is a, a very uh, potentially a very good source of radiation and we can tune radiation um, energies from hard X-ray to gamma ray range, and uh, they have some specific properties that, that would, could, be, could find a very good niche for applications. Okay, so um, I'm going to, um, yeah, sorry. Um, so this, this is going to be the structure of what I'm presenting. I'm um, going to just tell you briefly about basic concepts and classical radiation reaction. Then we will discuss what changes when you introduce quantum effects. And then uh, I'll show you some uh, pair creation, QD cascades, and optical traps examples. So these are, I mentioned there will be uh, new, um, new laser facilities. Uh, the, that are uh, providing a very intense lasers. So these are roughly the orders of magnitude here. So what's important to note is that the intensity expected is about 10 to the 24 watts per centimeter squared. Um, 10 to the 21 is what we have today in the best places. And okay, I'm sorry. Um, are you playing this from the PDF? Or <laughs> because this this doesn't look right. Okay, um, so uh, this is uh, this this is this is supposed to be um, uh, the normalized vector potential that's norm that's uh, defined here. So this is the only definition I'm going to bother you with today. So at 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter squared, um, uh, we have a naught of about one, uh, which means that. If you have a bigger A naught, we are kind of in this, uh, starting to be in a relativistic regime of interaction. So if you send a laser to an almost static plasma, you will get relativistic particles. Uh, and if you have A naught of 10, this is already um, somehow nonlinear relativistic regime of interaction. If you have A naught that's higher than that, um, you may end up uh, having uh, quantum effects. Okay, um, so um, to do simulations of these processes, we are using our Zaris uh, framework, uh, which, is, which is developed locally in Lisbon, and also it is um, in partnership with UCLA. Uh, we have, um, it's a massively parallel framework that, has, that works in the principle of domain, spatial domain decomposition, and uh, most calculations are local, 
we tend to minimize the communications between processors and the communications are necessary when some particles are switching boundaries or when the fields are propagating from one node to another. Um, so to be able to um, study the physics that I mentioned before, um, you uh, I have to be able to capture something like this, so don't worry about the formulas, but here we have an electron beam that originally has, uh, is an, has about 2 GV of energy, so think of the red is energetic. When we go towards blue, it means that the particles have lost energy. So there's a section of the beam that already interacted with the laser, there is a part that's still interacting, and here we have the electrons that never touched the laser yet. So What's happening if you're in a, this classical radiation reaction regime, the particles are radiating a lot, but they're radiating a lot of small photons. So um, each photon is uh, taking a small amount of energy and it looks, the whole thing looks smooth. So there's, you can even assign a trajectory to this uh, electrons. And those, um, and we have, after, after the interaction, we will have a clear slowdown of the, of the electron beam. So if you uh, want to know if you are, will have a, like quantum effects uh, in your system, you want what you want to know is that, well, is there, in a sense, is there enough energy to create an electron-positron pair? Um, and to do so from vacuum, uh, there is this Schwinger field uh, limit that's been uh, postulated, uh, uh, which it's, it is a, f a field that's uh, strong enough to separate an elect electron and positron from this vac vacuum fl fluctuations because maybe you've heard, uh, if you've seen any popular quantum, um, uh, quantum physics uh, videos, is that you, ha uh, you have uh, something assigned called a wave function, so the electron, uh, the vacuum is not considered completely empty. It's it's full of uh, particles and there are antiparticles that are are filling up this vacuum and there are some fluctuations there. But those are uh, whenever we do a measurement, those fluctuations are not visible. But if you have a very strong field, you can take an electron-positron pair from those vacuum fluctuations and separate them fast enough such that uh, they become real particles. Um, uh, other way to see that is like you have um, maybe two photons with enough energy collide and those, uh, this energy is converted to particles. And uh, this, this field would be strong enough to, to create electron positron pairs in vacuum. However, this field corresponds to 10 to the 29 watts per centimeter squared, which I, I didn't say will be available. So in the lab, we're expecting around 10 to the 24, so we're five orders of magnitude off. Um, but what we can do is use uh, relativistic particles, so accelerate electrons, such that they feel this field in their rest frame. So this is, uh, this is taking advantage of the theory of relativity to uh, get into conditions where we can see these processes. And to simulate uh, all this, what you need to do is uh, first, you need to add classical radiation reaction to the to the to the regular so the regular codes were completely um, based on Maxwell's equations for and it's there that they can take they can take into account the relativistic motion but they were not able to uh, t to take into okay sorry about this well, um, really not. Uh, okay, so um, we're not able to, um, the, the, the regular particle in cell codes were uh, basically classical, and now um, to introduce first quantum effects is to introduce this uh, classical radiation reaction, and then um, uh, that t can take into account some the, this example that I mentioned before, then we need to introduce quantum effects, and we do this through Monte Carlo algorithm. So the particle production is done this way. And then we need for specific performance enhancements, and uh, one of them is, for example, that you need to resample your particles, because 
if, uh, if you have an exponential rise of number of particles in the simulation, uh, it's very, very quickly you will get to a situation where even the biggest supercomputer in the world will not uh, be enough because your memory will not be enough to hold all these particles. So what you need to do is find clever schemes to resample dynamically your uh, distribution function of particles uh, such that uh, you don't lose the physics but uh, you continue doing good computation. So this slide doesn't look well, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, so um, this is the main um, particle cell algorithm and, uh, and then uh, what we have, th this is, this is the, the classical version of it. So you have a Lorentz force that pushes the particles there is a current, that, so the, the, cur the currents and the fields live on a grid and the particles are able to explore the full, uh, full phase space. So um, what we do is we, have the par we move the particles and then we calculate the currents. The currents are deposited on the grid nodes where then the fields are advanced uh, through Maxwell's equations. And then uh, those fields are interpolated to particle positions um, that then uh, afterwards serve to, uh, to push particles with the Lorentz force. So if you want to implement classical radiation reaction, you just have to uh, um, edit this step where you push the particles and you have to add, um, to add um, a, a force that's a radiation reaction force to the Lorentz force and it's, there are several candidates on how to do that and some of them are more uh, adequate for computations than others. And this can be seen in this uh, publication here. Um, what is not uh, obvious is that your resolution requirements are much dif uh, are different when you get to these very high fields and actually um, it depends, the, the resolution requirements do depend uh, whether you're in a regime of strong radiation reaction or not. Um, so when you have this in place, you can, uh, you can study configurations uh, of acceleration and radiation emission, uh, uh, like the one given here. So here we have an example um, of an all optical laser accelerator. So this is something that already exists in the laboratory they've been able to um, obtain electrons up to 8 GeV with, uh, with a laser. And um, so I'm not gonna explain details how this is done, but um, then when you have, um, let's say, few GeV, one, we can take one GeV electron beam, which is uh, now routinely available in many labs, you can, um, you can uh, scatter it with a laser of uh, an intensity about 10 to the 21 once per centimeter squared, which is something that's also nowadays available in the, for this example. And um, so you will, you will undulate the electron beam uh, in this field because it's a strong field that will make it oscillate. Um, and you will uh, obtain a strong flash of radiation on this detector put behind the interaction region. And when you do that, um, you will get a signal like this. So this would be a signal of one particle. So it's an elongated, uh, note that the scale is different on this axis, so this is, this is blown up. One uh, particle would leave a trace that's like a vertical thin line, and many particles give something like this. So you can collect this radiation on the detector. And um, what was uh, important to show uh, this is, so this is the work of my uh, PhD thesis. Um, it was important to show that even if you don't have a very good beam, because um, at the time the, the, the laser wake field acceleration um, was producing beams with kind of a wide energy spread. It was, it was quasi mono-energetic, but uh, not with the energy spread that's not very small. Um, so what was important to show that even if you have such a beam that's not very, uh, not perfect, you can uh, really measure this effect of radiation reaction. After the interaction, you can measure the slowdown. And um, then this motivated some experiments to be made with the current laser facilities and they've obtained results that are consistent with our finding. So for the future, um, we will, there are many labs that uh, 
will have different types of lasers and different types of beams available. So we can have a map of relative energy loss uh, versus the intensity of the laser. Um, and each line here would be, um, if you use an energy, uh, electron beam of a certain energy, what, what's the percentage of this energy you can convert to radiation? And as you can see, there are many parameters to explore. So this is a completely unexplored region uh, of parameters uh, because we don't know. So we, we have the well-established theories when we are fully in a quantum regime or fully in a classical regime. These transitions are still quite a, a lot of uh, open questions. And uh, here you can see the transition to the quantum regime. This is when um, we, are, uh, we have uh, particles feeling the Schwinger field in the rest frame. So you can see that you can either enter radiation-dominated regime early and have uh, almost no quantum effects, there, uh, the strong quantum effects uh, um, on this side, or you can actually enter quantum effect, uh, quantum interaction immediately, even before you have uh, had your beam lo lose a lot of energy. So what changes when you have quantum effects uh, dominating is that now those photons, I mentioned that uh, particles radiate, they are strong photons. And again, we have a slide that's not, <laughs> that's been, um, this not, not well placed here. Um, so uh, we, we have, um, the algorithm changes because now in, uh, we have a Monte Carlo uh, that, uh, that uh, roll, uh, so we roll a dice saying, okay, are we emitting a photon or not at every time step? And uh, so for, for, for the electrons that emit a photon, they, uh, the, we, we then add those photons, hard photons, as uh, new particle species. And those photons can themselves decay into pairs, so they can add electrons and positrons to regular plasma species, and they participate in the current. So what matters is that this current now um, can be affected by the quantum effects. And uh, this means that, uh, as we already had a classical module that uh, incorporates the interaction between the fields and the particles, and the particles can take energy from the fields, fields can take energy from the particles. So here, new products uh, from quantum processes can affect the background field. And uh, we also have to do this particle merging that uh, uh, that resamples the distribution function uh, to control the control the number of simulation particles. And uh, what happens is when we have this uh, quantum regime of radiation reaction, so if this is energy versus time for a distribution, uh, and the thickness of the distribution function is uh, given by standard deviation here, um, you can see that uh, there is a kind of a tendency to, if you start with a very narrow distribution, you can spread it, spread it, and shrink it afterwards. So this is a competition between um, what you call average classical-like drift, because the particles are radiating, so overall they are losing energy. But then there is this quantum effect that is stochastic, uh, that is, uh, um, ten it tends to uh, spread the distribution function, uh, and this is going to be best seen uh, here on this example, where we have um, we have uh, the classical and the quantum case. So we start with, this is, a, this is transverse momentum in two directions. So we start with no transverse momentum at zero at, in both places. Now, as we progress, the, par the laser is interacting with the particles and giving them transverse momentum. Uh, but, uh, so here we have, um, situation that is different for um, classi for classical uh, for classical case everything is deterministic and we have uh, we have a narrow distribution function that stays narrow because all particles do the same thing and here we have a distribution of particles okay so uh, and then after the interaction is over we have a residual momentum spread uh, as a result of this quantum stochasticity so the result um, of, this, uh, uh, of this research is that um, as you, can, you can have a perfect beam with a no energy spread and, or a wide energy spread beam to start with, 
And after interacting with a laser, what's going to happen to this uh, beam is um, after some time, if you have enough interaction time that this classical uh, versus quantum tendency are in balance, you will obtain a predictable energy spread the, uh, of the distribution function that, is, uh, that does not depend on the initial conditions. Okay, so now we're going to, um, to tell you how, how things move when you go to even higher intensities and you get uh, really in the quantum dominated regime because so what I've shown on the last slide was where quantum effects uh, appear but uh, uh, they are kind of, in, they, they are, uh, they're visible but they're not really dominated, dominating the interaction. So here uh, we have an example of um, 10 GeV electron beam in slack that's interacting with the 10 to the 20 watts per centimeter squared laser, but since the electron beam energy is very high, it's really in the quantum regime already. And you can see the photon emission, this, these are the photons from this interaction, they go almost to 10 GeV themselves. So like, okay, you can see here eight, examples of eight, nine GeV. So almost all energy of the electrons can be co converted to one photon. Um, and, um, what this means is that we have, uh, we, we will be able to see electron positron pairs created uh, in a, so, um, and this, okay, so this doesn't work. Now the, I'm, I'm not sure if this was, um, sorry about that, so I think we had a <laughs> misunderstanding with the technical team here. Um, so this was supposed to be a movie. Uh, and you're supposed to see the positrons creating, uh, created here. Um, and uh, the, the, so the positrons are created only in the middle of the, in the center of the propagation. And here we have a map of uh, energy versus angle that you would get on a detector. So you could have about two GeV positrons from this uh, interaction. And if you have, uh, electron beams of different sizes compared to if this is the laser and the electron beam, of course you will have different positron rates depending on which uh, section of the electron beam is interacting with the highest intensity. And you can have different configurations so we can interact the electron beams and lasers at 90 degrees. We can then accelerate the positrons uh, that are created in this interaction and we can further accelerate them in a plasma using some um, some other schemes like direct laser acceleration in a plasma channel, so I don't have time to go into details about all of this. But we can use, we can couple uh, different ideas from laser plasma interaction to provide uh, electron positron sources and to provide the energetic positron beams for future colliders. Now, um, I mentioned QED cascades, so uh, I wanted to show you, okay, this one works. Sorry. So uh, this is a um, standing wave that you can produce by co colliding two lasers head on. So this is for linear polarization and these are two circular polarization options. So the electric field is red and um, the magnetic field is green. I'm going to re try to replay this. Uh, no. <laughs> um, okay, I'm not able to do this. So, um, so what is important here is that uh, this, this is a very intense field and it's a standing wave of a very intense field. So you can, uh, in principle, can we play this? Yes. So you can collide two lasers and put a target in between them and then th those particles of the target are going to be seed particles to create a QD cascade and you can create an electron-positron plasma this way. Okay, and uh, this is, um, so to deal with the, uh, the, the very, uh, diff very uh, high demand on the memory by uh, introducing a lot of particles, we had to do a particle merging algorithm and we, we kind of, we had to devise an algorithm that uh, conserves all momentums of the distribution, so we needed to, uh, conserve the most, preserve most physics that uh, was possible. So we, had, we first identified the particles close in configuration space and then 
particles. So this slide also has a problem. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, uh, we have particles closed in the momentum space. And uh, then when we decide what are particles that could be merged, then we have equations to satisfy with the total particle weight that, uh, that mimics charge conservation, uh, momentum conservation, and we have uh, energy conservation. And we can do that uh, all at once by, um, by merging those particles not into one, but into two, two, two new particles. And um, we, we did extensive benchmarking of this uh, merging scheme. Um, and you get the same growth rate and, well, and uh, also the momentums of the particles distribution. And you can see the weight. So if you start with a weight of one uh, for each uh, macroparticle, um, you, you may get f some particles that are uh, even five orders of magnitude higher weight than initially, uh, especially for photons. But uh, overall, the physics is well simulated. Um, and so those very, very heavy particles are actually very few because these, these are on the concentration um, where the concentration of high field happens. This is uh, and the density, uh, the density pileup happens in few places. So by doing this, we don't just uh, reduce the, number, the problem, but we also reduce the load imbalance of the problem. So uh, this kind of uh, framework allows us to simulate uh, and show, show actually when the light will be depleted. So uh, as a function of that A-naught parameter that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, you can get to uh, close to 100% uh, absorption in, for some, in some experiments in the future. And now I'm going to ask the, uh, the tech team to, to show you a video. Uh, we, have a video uh, we have a situation where we have a standing wave in an optical trap of four lasers. Um, and so the plasma seed is here, it's like a, a nanowire. Uh, and you will see the cascade develop and the field get depleted. So can we have the video, please? So here you have the four lasers and there is this uh, nanowire of the cryogenic ice. Uh, the field lines are shown like this with this vector plot and this is the plasma density will be rising. So the standing wave is undisrupted before a certain critical density is achieved. Once we achieve this critical density, uh, which is roughly this moment when the, the surface plot goes up, um, we, we have a full a start depletion of the wave and uh, it can be uh, almost fully depleted. Thank you. So can we go back? Yep. Uh, so this is... Um, uh, this is, uh, we can see here the density, so the critical density is um, relativistic critical density. Okay, this is, uh, this is uh, a density where the light cannot propagate anymore. It's, uh, and this is, um, this is uh, for example, when you reach a, a solid, solid density of, uh, of um, your electron position plasma. Ah, no, this works. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so now, um, if you want to um, use this as a source, you can do it uh, if, you, if you are interested in very, very hard uh, photons, like this is gamma ray range. So above, here we have above half a GV. They are very well uh, directed along the ac these two axes of interaction. So you can, um, you can collect them um, in, with the with the detector for experiments, but also we, one can envisage this as a as a application for sources. So um, this new generation of lasers allows us many opportunities um, for research for us, but for applications also in for um, industry and so on. And what we would what um, my activities are going to be in the future is. Um, planning to continue working on exotic physics at the extreme, um, but also we're going to explore uh, the options for particle and radiation sources for applications. And one thing here that you have an example, this is a phase contrast imaging that is very good for biological and medical samples because 
um, their special uh, properties of the sources we can get in plasmas that uh, give us, it's called high spatial co coherence, but uh, it can give a very good contrast for small density variations, so it, ca it can make uh, imaging uh, much better than it is today. And uh, we can have a full 3D reconstruction with one shot. So it's like having an MRI scan with a high contra higher contrast, but um, with a much simpler device. And also, um, we have some started starting initiatives for quantum computing for plasmas. So we will think about this in the future. And of course, high performance computing is uh, staying one of our main uh, research um, interests because this is the main tool that we are, uh, the, um, our main tool requires uh, using the big machines efficiently such that we can get our uh, problems done. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for this very interesting talk. I'm sure there are many questions. Okay, I can start. So uh, you showed this equation of motion for particles uh, using Lorentz forces. Uh, and you said that you are using some in-house code to, to, to propagate this? So uh, we have an in-house in particle in cell um, frame of Osiris. So this was, um, this is the, the code that deals with, uh, with particles and the fields. So it was existing already before I came to do my research. But um, then to, to incorporate radiation reaction quantum processes, we had to work on adding this separately as modules to, to the code. Because so, I could imagine also that you could do that with some empty code, you could adapt molecular dynamics code and put all these fields. What in. do you mean by empty? <laughs> molecular dynamics. Uh, molecular dynamics. It's a, it's, not, it's a classical code, but uh, just uh, solving Newton equations. But if, if you could incorporate yes. this uh, Lorentz code. No, what I was asking is actually that typically in MD you don't have velocity MD. dependent uh, forces. Here you have velocity dependent force. So you must use some special integrators or not? Yeah, so, well, I mean, this is, a, I didn't but talk about that, technical. but yeah, we have, so there's several advantages of using um, uh, particles and grid uh, together, because first of all, if you want to uh, capture long distance particle-particle interactions, uh, you don't need to go through like every pair of particles. You, the, the interaction is mediated by the grid, so the particles deposit current and this then the current affects the fields that propagate. So uh, the, most of the calculations this way are lo local and this makes it possible to parallelize the algorithm. So this is one thing. The other thing is if you have particle-particle codes, you cannot um, simulate wave propagation. So we could not simulate lasers, in, for example, in this kind of... Uh, yeah, in, you, in this to, kind of you would have to couple it with some external. And you method. could, yeah, so you could incorporate lasers as an external field, but then you don't uh, account for the full dynamics because the laser is going to be affected by the plasma dynamics as well. So to make it fully self consistent, uh, you actually need to, to do particle in cell, it's uh, kinetic modeling. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for the interesting talk. Uh, in the movie that uh, you showed, uh, mm -hmm. I think you have uh, used uh, four uh, Gaussian beam. That, is that correct? Uh, the movie that... Uh, yes, four? yes, in the movie, yes. Uh, I was wondering why you haven't used, for example, a circular beam that's approached to the center. Can you please repeat the second part? I didn't hear yeah, well. Yeah, a circular beam. The beam that Circ have a circular we don't hear you. and approach to the beam. Can you talk a bit louder, please? Or closer talk. to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I mean, uh, in the state of uh, four Gaussian beam, uh, why you haven't used, for example, uh, a structure beam like a Bessel beam or Irie beam, that they have a, a circular structure because I think the distribution you have showed, it would be more, uh, more homogeneous. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so we have the capability to, to put uh, like our Gaussian beams, for example, or um, we, so we, this, there is no reason not to simulate that. Uh, the problem is that if you uh, are looking to these applications of the high field, uh, uh, in the first experiments, it's going to be a Gaussian beam and it's going to be linearly polarized because uh, making light circularly polarized require and or um, making putting their uh, additional modes purposefully okay it requires some um, some manage some um, manipulation of light with instruments so the higher we go with light it becomes uh, more difficult to have instruments uh, there and not being damaged so um, the, the, so first experiments will be done with Gaussian lasers, and this is why we did those simulations that way. But we are completely able to look into um, higher modes for uh, for different applications, and actually we are doing it, uh, for example, to mimic, because the lasers are not perfect. Lasers are never really perfectly Gaussian, and we can, we can model uh, the, the imperfections of the laser beams by adding some modes on top of the Gaussian. There was also a question from the stream, uh, but I think that you answered it in the last slide. So can you use quantum computers for this exponential, for its exponential advantage? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the answer for that particular question is I'm not sure if we can use it directly for the cascades uh, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way yet. So what we are doing is um, right now there is a few very few uh, people in the world that are uh, looking into quantum computing for plasmas. It's really at its uh, infancy, and this is because the quantum computing uh, computers were um, usually thought of um, uh, to, to solve the problems that are natively, easily mappable to quantum computing, quantum uh, to qubits. We don't have that easily done in plasma because plasmas are highly nonlinear. And, uh, but there are some schemes in the last few years devised how to map the nonlinearity to qubits, and some problems can start to be um, looked at. But we are still at the level of toy models. Okay, and uh, what we are, our our research in this direction um, is also so is also um, so far looking at toy models. It's not something that will. Uh, directly impact uh, our simulation efficiency in the next few years, but we would like to identify what are the problems that could efficiently uh, take advantage of the quantum computing. Uh, and so far, this is an open question. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, so uh, that was an interesting talk. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, so the standard electromagnetic particle in cell schemes correspond to a discretization of uh, less or Maxwell uh, mm -hmm. system, right? Yes. But when you add these radiation terms, then is it still correspond to some form or is it has res relation to less or system or how does it? Yes, so uh, the radiation reaction, you can think of this as an additional damping force in the system at the first approximation. So this is, this is when it's fully classical. Uh, when we have um, quantum, uh, where we enter the quantum regime, you really have to couple. So the Maxwell Vlasov system is there to um, tell you how the plasma interacts with the fields, but uh, the quantum quantum effects that show up, they're not necessarily, they're not happening everywhere all the time, but they have a pr probability to happen. So it's, it's re manifests itself um, for the plasma, uh, Maxwell solver, um, uh, as um, rising density or rising current density at the local level. So we are adding an electron and positron pair there added in the same spot, so the charge neutrality is not violated by adding a pair. And also, um, most of the times, these are already relativistic particles, so the current neutrality is also, most of the time, uh, still there when they show up. But then the, you apply the fields on them, they move in different directions, and those, uh, uh, once this happens, they, they really just participate in the regular plasma dynamics. So we're back to, um, Maxwell loss of um, kinetic code.
Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other question? So if not, uh, let us thank uh, Maria again. Thank you. And congratulations for the work. Thank you.